I'd like to present the next uh, person to show you his work. It's uh, Trent McConaughey, and it's rewiring the internet for ownership with big data and blockchains. And um, I also would like to thank our sponsors that you can clearly see here. And uh, you guys should remember that the panel is coming in like a two and a half hours. First, we have this talk. After this talk, we change rooms, if you want. <laughs> and yeah, so please welcome Trent. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, um, and I'm really honored to be able to keynote this conference. I've been a big fan and user of Python for a long time. I think we were shipping Python code in about 2003 or so, so um, in my previous company. So today I'm going to be talking about the internet and big data and blockchains and some other cool stuff. Lots of Python, too. Uh, let's get going. So. If any of you guys know me uh, very well, I really love robots. <laughs> so uh, it's maybe embarrassing to admit, but probably once a week or um, every couple of weeks, I go to Google image search and I type a search for robot and then look at cool robots. And why do I do this? Sometimes just because it's cool, new things emerge. You know, you do different searches, furry robots, marmot robots, Terminator robots, whatever, right? There's a lot of robot images out there. Um, and even for this talk, I actually was doing it this morning. <laughs> so um, I really love robots, but there's a challenge. You know, if I want to use uh, an image of a robot, uh, and I want to make sure that I have, um, I'm using it in a way that is fair to the creator, the person who took that photo, the person who created that image, uh, how do I do that? So if I um, filter with Google Image Search and say, I'm only wanting to use the robots' images that are um, basically reusable or reusable uh, with modifications, in, um, there's only a very small fraction. So in this first page, there's only one robot that I can use, right? The rest, no, nope, you can't touch those robots. Um, or you can, I suppose, if you want, but you're not giving fair attribution, you're not um, going to be fairly compensating that creator, and you're very likely not using it legally. So that's really a problem, and it turns out that on the internet, 85% of images um, found in Google Search are actually uh, used in a non-legal way. And most of this time, you know, people use it just on their home page, and it doesn't make a big difference. But there's a lot of times where businesses use it and otherwise, um, and it's really not very fair to the creators. So creators are kind of getting a, a short shrift. Um, do you guys remember the, the Sony rootkit issue of 2005 till 2007? So if you want to um, go and uh, listen to an album at that time, let's say you really love Mariah Carey, so you buy her Mariah Carey album from 2005. Well, you, you load that CD into your computer, and uh, you start playing it, and immediately um, Sony installed this rootkit, which was an OS-level um, piece of software, and it actually basically opened up a giant backdoor for all the hackers of the world. And it wasn't just you know, one or two people's machines that got infected, there was a total of 22 million CDs that were shipped. Why did this happen? Um, it was basically because Sony was trying to protect the, the ownership um, that they had, um, that they had licensed from the artists. So, and it wasn't just Mariah Carey, it was uh, other um, musicians as well. Uh, Our Lady Peace, a really awesome Canadian band, got affected. There was dozens of different um, bands that were affected, and in the end, um, it really points to a challenge. And that challenge is about DRM itself. The idea of taking a file and trying to lock it up really try is defying the physics of bits. Um, because, you know, at the very least, there's an analog hole, right? Um, someone takes an image and then they decrypt it to display it. Well, I take a photograph, boom, and I have it, right? And so there's just all these different challenges that where DRM really hasn't worked. Another great example um, is DVDs. And I don't know if you guys remember, uh, Sony and this consortium designed the DVD, and they, they spent um, 20 or $30 million uh, in order to, in order to uh, have proper uh, encryption in all of this DRM. And then within two days or three days of DVDs being released, uh, it was cracked. And Sony said, oh my god, it must have been the NSA or some heavy-duty, high-powered organization that was um, uh, uncovered this. And no, it turns out it wasn't some high-powered organization. It wasn't the NSA. It was a kid named John. He was a teenager. That's it. So um, it, this just kind of proves the point that DRM um, is not only not very fair to consumers, not very useful for consumers, um, it's really bad for sort of all involved. And in an ironic twist of fate, uh, this rootkit thing that I pointed to here to start with, some of the Sony rootkit code used some of the code that John had used to hack the, the DRM initially from the DVDs. So a funny irony there. 
Uh, there's other problems out there as well. Uh, let's say that you want to become uh, a music company and you want to help people discover music. So there's creators out there and then there's the consumers, the music lovers, and you want to connect them. So your SoundCloud or Spotify or one of these companies, well, in order to um, have a proper um, a, a, um, access to all the artists of the world, you know, 90%, 95% consumed, you actually have to talk to the music labels. And depending how you count it, there's three or four of these 800-pound gorillas out there, and you basically have to make a, cut a deal with them. To cut that deal, they're going to want to take their five pounds of flesh. So um, Spotify, a major portion of Spotify is owned by the music labels. SoundCloud doesn't f fully um, currently have all the licenses, and those music labels want their five pounds of flesh. So that's really a challenge, of course, right? So um, it's, it's kind of too bad, right? Because this means that if you're a, a company that's really trying to connect the, the lovers of music with the creators of music, um, you have to spend so much time and energy in the legals of it all, rather than focusing on the user experience, rather than focusing on um, you know, helping the c creators get compensated. Or, you know, I'm an English speaker. Um, I moved to Berlin uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, sadly to say, my German is not that great yet. And so, but I, so I want to watch new release English movies. And so can I use iTunes? No, because it sees where my IP address is and d decides that um, it's going to overdub in German for me. Um, can I use uh, Amazon? No, same problem. Can I use Netflix? Yes, but they don't have new release movies. And it turns out there's actually no options for me except to use VPNs, which is sort of a, a legal gray zone. And this is what I get all the time for things like this. YouTube, you know, friends send me links and so on. And there's just this challenge of um, the, the DRM, um, there's sort of a misalignment between what consumers want and what's being offered. And it's um, basically really hard to access. So I want to compensate the creators. Um, I don't want to just you know, download movies for free. I want to pay. There's no way for me to do it. Um, here's another challenge out there in the world. Um, let's say that I, I love art. In fact, I love art myself. And um, collecting digital art is, is a pretty cool idea because you see this you know, image, um, like this piece from Jonathan Monaghan um, uh, called Escape Pod. It's actually a video and you want to buy it. And how, how can you buy it in a way where you truly own it? So I buy the piece for $1,000 from Jonathan. He would probably give me a USB stick in the past, and then I want to go and resell it. So uh, when I try and go and resell it to one of you out there, say Don, um, Don might ask me, hey Trent, you know, how do I know that you own it? How do I know you didn't just download it from the torrents? And I won't have a very good answer. So that's really a problem. And in fact, in the art world, this $64 billion market, um, the, the, the digital art part is called an elephant in the room problem. It's still unsolved, or was still unsolved. 3D printing, another problem too. So if you think about you know, Shapeways and Thingiverse, these companies out there, um, it's really hard to upload your work and then trust that it won't be stolen. So if you go to the blogs of Shapeways, you'll see quotes like this. My conclusion is that whatever you put on the internet, you lose it. Maybe you keep the rights, but you lose the power over it. So theoretically, you have the ownership. Practically, you don't. And there's sort of a way to think about all of this in the world. There's sort of two zones. Um, there's, on the left, the copyright zone, where you have this sort of DRM lockdown castle. It's restricted, difficult to reuse, difficult to share. And on the right, you have this sort of public domain ocean. Uh, it's unrestricted use. Um, and there's a lot of good material out there, and it's growing. But there's also a lot of inferior and outdated material. And, um, the challenge is that a lot of the material that you might want to use is actually hidden behind these castle walls. So to summarize, if you think about it, ownership of digital property, especially on the internet, is a mess. It's a mess for all of those involved. For the creators, it's really hard to get compensated because sharing means losing control. And a lot of people simply, a lot of creators, artists, 3D designers, and so on, simply don't put their work up online because they see that it will get um, taken and used um, in ways they don't want. Um, for collectors and audiences, um, there's really no secondary markets for things like digital art and otherwise. And for the connectors of the world, um, you have to, you're often distracted by legals, um, those third-party companies that want their five pounds of flesh. And if you look at it, throw a rock and you'll find a problem in any vertical almost, from digital art, photography, 3D, music, videos. Unless you guys think that Tidal is the solution, but <laughs> um, anyway, so really, it's a challenge acro across out there. And you might summarize this challenge as, where's my stuff? And to break that down, um, you can break it down to the where's and my stuff part. 
The wearers means you don't have visibility into what's going on. So uh, you don't know that it's been shared. Um, you know, you put a, a piece of work out there. You don't know where it's been shared to and what's going on. And the my stuff part means that the legals are really painful. Um, if you want to sell a piece of digital art right now, quite often these days, you actually have to hire a lawyer, spend 1,000 or 5,000 euros, he'll figure out a contract for you, and, um, and then you'll have it done. And that's very heavy. I mean, what if you only want to sell a piece of digital art for 10 euros or 100 euros? You just spent most of the money on your lawyer. And so there's this really painful legals. You can summarize that part as the user experience for IP is broken. So we, we can ask this question, why is it like this? Why do we have this mess? So, so let's take a look at some history of the World Wide Web. So we go back to 1980, um, 1989, and um, actually it was 1988. Um, in May of 1988, Tim Berners-Lee made a proposal to his manager at CERN uh, about this World Wide Web. Uh, about this hypertext protocol that he wanted to do. And it was based on, you know, there was lots of research going on before, decades before, but um, he made this proposal. His boss said, hey, that sounds kind of cool. Go ahead, go do this. Go ahead, Tim. And a year and a half later, um, within a year and a half, he had invented HTTP, HTML, um, th uh, the world's first web browser, all of these pieces that you need for this overall system of a World Wide Web. And um, by almost any measure, it's been wildly successful. So. It, it, depending on how, how, how you count it, there's, well, billions and billions, um, possibly even a trillion web pages out there now. It's, and it's you know, profoundly changed society itself. Now when we think about the internet, we usually think about the World Wide Web. And even when you think about society, a lot of it is di directly related to the World Wide Web. So this piece of technology that was invented uh, very recently, only 25 years ago, has had a profound impact. But it actually has a problem. Uh, and um, I'm going to illustrate kind of how. So let's say we create some art and put it on the net. So let's say I drew this robot, because you know, I've always wanted to be an artist, but uh, no. Uh, so I create this robot, and I, um, it's obviously great. And let's say that I put it on the web. Well, what can happen is other people can take that, um, save it, and then put it on their web page. And they don't have to even attribute me. There's no, nothing that's forcing them to attribute or anything. And they can copy, and they can even sell it on their sites. And I wouldn't hear about it. I wouldn't know about it. Um, there's also the unidirectional links, which the World Wide Web has. So I could take, um, if I'm I, uh, one of you out there, I could take Trent's image and I could um, put it on my site and then link back to the original site. That's pretty cool. Uh, however, I won't know about it because it's only unidirectional links, so, um, which is actually kind of too bad too. Or even worse, and this happens all the time as well, misattribution, right? So someone else claims that work and then um, a third person attributes the person who has copied that work and claimed it as their own. This happens all the time. We deal with a lot of digital artists, and they're like, oh my god, I can't believe that you guys are doing something about this, because this just happened to me last week. In fact, I was talking with a digital artist just yesterday, where, once again, this happened. <laughs> so there's um, a, a few pretty big problems with the World Wide Web. And you can summarize it as, um, in the Where's My Stuff challenge, uh, there's no visibility, because if someone uses my stuff, I don't know about it. And the my stuff, once again, the legals are painful. Uh, Jeff Atwood, uh, who most of you guys I'm sure are well aware of, he has this really cool quote. The current World Wide Web does basically one thing. Simple, stupid, mindless hyperlinks. But that alone, to the credit of Tim Berners-Lee and the World Wide Web, that alone was enough to build a functional and useful internet for the world. So. Now, uh, the question is then, does it need to be this way? So if we look at the history of the internet pre-World Wide Web, what's out there? So this is, uh, go back to 1965, Ted Nelson. Consider a unified service that would provide storage and publication services and manage royalty payment on a fair basis that would facilitate unrestricted virtual republishing. Sounds like a pretty awesome vision, right? This is a, a quote from 1965. It's called Xanadu, the Xanadu project, the original hypertext pro um, project, in fact. Um, Ted Nelson actually coined the term hypertext. And what he envisioned was the following. A new middle realm, one which renders copyright benign and flexible, a win-win system at as, as it is beneficial to both rights holders and to users, in a way that other copyright systems are not beneficial to users. So on the left, you have this restricted copyright zone. It's always going to be there. Some people are going to want to lock down things with their heavy castles, even though a DRM doesn't work. They're going to still try. And on the far right, you have the unrestricted public domain zone. 
ocean. And, uh, but in the middle, you have this new, what, what Ted Nelson calls, he calls it a trans-publishing zone. Um, and it's anything that can be quoted, republished, um, et cetera, et cetera, without difficulty, retaining the copyright and retaining the copyright benefits. And so this is kind of a cool idea, basically fixing the UX for copyright. It goes back to 1965. In fact, that was the, when the paper was published. It was even earlier that Ted Nelson started talking about this. So the Xanadu design uh, looks like the following. Um, with my, from my original image, whenever someone uses it, there's actually links um, both ways, bi-directional links. So, uh, and it's built into the system, actually. So, and the second thing is that it actually has baked-in copyright. And, in our, and to solve this overall problem, then, on the where's part, you get the visibility into the usage of your work simply from these bi-directional links. And the my stuff part, um, the legals, um, it actually addresses it via baked-in copyright. So really an amazing vision. And uh, Ted Nelson actually spent um, years working on this. Um, here's a mock-up from 1972 showing these bi-directional links. And in fact, um, he continues to this day to be working on it. Um, he's going to be releasing some stuff in the next uh, few months, some videos explaining it all. I was having some correspondence with him. So, um, but it actually turns out that the Xanadu design was, <laughs> to put it mildly, a little more complicated than that. So here's a design from 1968. You've got this um, metastructure level, uh, this construct level. It's actually pretty complicated to think about transclusions, all of this sort of stuff. And it turns out that this was, in practice, very hard to implement. So what happened was, it was so complex, it was so hard to build to do a really good job on, that it's considered the longest running case of vaporware ever. Uh, even more than Duke Nukem Forever, actually, <laughs> which is quite a feat, right? And, one second. Uh, even more than Duke Nukem Forever. And then along came the simpler World Wide Web that um, Tim Berners-Lee released in Christmas of 1990 and basically ate its lunch. So um, during the 80s and early 90s, um, Ted Nelson, continu continuing on these efforts, uh, he, he had started a company on this. That company had been bought by AutoCAD, Autodesk, the AutoCAD guys. And um, they were actually building this, building this, building this. And within a couple of years of the web being released, um, Autodesk shut that effort down. And it kind of made sense, right? I mean, there was a clear winner here. And in the end, um, Xanadu got largely abandoned. So now we have the World Wide Web, warts and all. And uh, Ted Nelson has this just really awesome quote. Uh, HTML is precisely what we are trying to prevent. <laughs> Ever-breaking links, no rights management. And it's like, exactly true. So to summarize so far, what we've got is ownership of digital property, especially on the internet, is a mess, despite being anticipated since the 60s and designed for. But of course, this, seems, this happens often in software, the simplicity won out, in this case, the simplicity of the World Wide Web. But what that meant is that the question of where's my stuff went unsolved. So a question we've been asking ourselves is, can we retrofit the internet for ownership? Can we realize some of the aims of Xanadu in the process? Not necessarily the design of Xanadu, but at least the aims. And that's a question I've been asking myself and my colleagues. So here's the idea. Have the bi-directional links, but don't force them into the design initially. Just auto-discover them. And the second part is, make the legals secure and easy. So to summarize, um, this is how, how the where's my stuff part gets answered. Once again, auto bidirectional links and easy to secure legals. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand on each of these and then I'm going to show you how we do it in Python. <laughs> so on the where's part, this is actually, uh, well, we, we swallow the web, okay? So we crawl the entire internet. And uh, if you restrict the, uh, the web pages, um, the World Wide Web, to uh, files that are one megabyte in size, you end up with 220 terabytes of text, okay? And a subset of those are links to images and other media, but um, let's focus on images. Then what you can do is a similarity match against the creator's content. So there's uh, 13 billion images, there's a bunch of 3D designs, all this sort of stuff. And if you think about this, this is a machine learning problem at internet scale, right? And uh, so this is how we do it. Um, and what this does is to know when someone is using your work, 
right? And the cool thing is, these days, this is actually, you know, there's a lot of great big data tools to do that. You run this with AWS, you have um, different libraries to do, for, do different things, and you can do this uh, quite straightforwardly in terms of code. It's actually a relatively small amount of code, well deployed. The challenge actually is to wrangle the big data itself, right? Because it's a lot of text. Uh, a lot of text and images too, right? Because from this 220 terabytes of text, you get 13 billion images. How do you handle that, right? Um, and actually, interestingly, one of the reasons we weren't um, scared of this is in my previous uh, work, uh, where I was using machine learning to design computer chips, uh, CAD software for that, um, we were uh, routinely handling 100 billion data points, or even a trillion. So. 100 billion data points down to 13 billion is like easy peasy, one tenth the size, right? So um, that's sort of why we sort of realized we could go for this without it being terribly daunting. Now on the my stuff side, um, to basically lock down the legals in a way that is useful, um, there's two parts. Uh, there's the, the actual legals and then the securing it in some sort of time stamping fashion. So in our terms of service, when you use a scribe and say, I agree to the terms of service, it's kind of a special terms of service. Uh, when you register your piece of work, and I'll give a demo later, you're actually saying, I claim that I have the copyright rights to this. And um, then also, um, when you go to re um, transfer ownership from yourself to someone who has bought one of your limited digital editions, um, it's actually transferring the copyright rights to that person. Um, think of it like licensing plus plus. So in a sense, it's copyright in a box. It's fixing the UX for IP. You don't have to hire a lawyer and spend a thousand euros or five thousand euros to sort this out. It's just under the hood. It's there. And in fact, we have a, a, a lawyer on staff who has spent the last ten years living and breathing copyright, uh, and he really cares about this. So, in fact, his his last gig, he cares about privacy too. So, his previous gig, uh, he did a class action lawsuit on behalf of all of Canada against Facebook for screwing with users' privacy, and he won, by the way. So, we're very very happy to have him. And the reason is we're really leveraging this towards um, making IP accessible to all. Now, the second thing is securing the copyright. So uh, once we, we say, OK, when you use this, the magic happens in the terms of service on this copyright transfer. But we want to make sure that you don't have to just trust a scribe. You know, what if something happens to us? We go away, anything like that. Um, imagine if it could be stored on this, this ledger that um, is owned by no one or owned by everyone. Um, that's sort of out there. It's like etching into stone if you record on it. And that, of course, is the Bitcoin blockchain. Right? So uh, the very first use case of the, the Bitcoin blockchain is Bitcoin itself. And it's basically the world's first practical solution to electronic money in a way that people sufficiently trust. Um, we're using it as well, um, not to transfer tokens, but simply as a timestamping mechanism. And in fact, Bitcoin itself, um, it was, it's actually a combination of two things. It's a combination of um, work on timestamping that goes back 10 years prior to that, and uh, Hashcash, which is basically um, proof of work tied with money in a sense. So that's what Bitcoin did, was actually tie together this concept of a blockchain from previous work, as well as the, the, the money side um, for incentivization. So we're actually using the blockchain, and every time one of these transactions happen, every single register, everything, every single transfer, loan, consign, all of this stuff, we're actually um, recording that transaction onto the blockchain itself. And we actually created a, a blockchain overlay, a, a protocol called SPOOL, a secure, secure Public Online Ownership Ledger. And um, then the timestamp is basically evidence that this happened in case there's ever an ownership dispute. And we actually had been w worrying, you know, what if um, the blockchain isn't used in a court of law as evidence? Well, it turns out that thanks to the Silk Road trials, uh, the blockchain actually was used as evidence there. And to the jury, it was like, no problem. It, it works. It's fine. And so Silk Road was actually very useful to us. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because hard drives have been used in court for decades uh, as evidence. And um, they can be tampered with much more easily than the blockchain. So the blockchain is sort of like this um, much more tamper-resistant hard drive, in a sense. So to give you a feel of the terms of service, we have this you know, fairly long terms of service. Here's a snippet from it. And we keep updating this and improving it as we go along. As well, um, the ownership protocol, um, the spool, um, is basically supporting all these different actions. And they are, you know, the core ones are to transfer and to register. So register as in, I claim that I have the copyright rights, and to transfer as in, I bequeath some of these copyright rights to the new owner. And I'm going to zoom into each of these um, shortly here. So overall, this is what the tech stack looks like for a scribe. On the very top, we have, um, there's uh, sort of two ways to use it. There's marketplaces and other institutions, organizations, et cetera. And then there's our own web app at ascribe.io. 
And both of those use our REST API, which is you know, a standard RESTful API, all of that. Um, and by the way, the marketplaces then, um, I guess I'll get into this, but um, this means that anyone else can use this service too, um, anyone building their own service on top. In fact, even already, there's a couple companies that are starting. Um, they've actually started to build uh, on top of Ascribe uh, digital art marketplaces. And there's several other people who are using us as well who are established companies. So um, there's the REST API, and then below that, of course, is the, our servers for ownership. And below that, um, basically, it's um, basically the technology needed to support these two main features, auto-discovering the bidirectional links and easy, secure legals. So to auto-discover the bidirectional links, this is uh, crawling the web mixed with uh, um, internet-scale machine learning. And then that's actually you know, the database that we're crawling, that we're looking at, is the internet itself. right? And uh, on the easy, secure, legal side, there's really two parts. There's the terms of service, which of course is you know, not very much in, from a code perspective, but it really matters overall, so it's a major pillar. And the second thing is the blockchain side. So on the blockchain side, there is, at the very lowest level, the Bitcoin blockchain itself, this, this very special database, right? Think of it like a blue ocean database where it was, it, it was it's basically a database, but it has a couple new features that are really special, right? Um, no one owns it. Once you write to it, you can never delete from it. And it's kind of not as good at a lot of the um, traditional um, measures of, of value of a database. Like, it doesn't have that high throughput. It doesn't store that much. You know, it's only 30 gigabytes, but people talk about blockchain bloat. But that's okay, because for how we use it, um, it's perfectly fine. And on top of the blockchain, the API to the blockchain is the Bitcoin protocol. On top of that is our overlay called the Spool protocol. So it's a, a, a special dialect of the Bitcoin protocol just for ownership. And then on top of that is something called PySpool and transactions. And these are two Bitcoin libraries that we have written in Ascribe to implement the Spool protocol. And we actually just open sourced um, them in the last couple of weeks. So uh, I'll be zooming into those as well. And basically the ownership servers use all of this stuff to implement ownership. So I'm going to talk about the different interfaces then. Uh, I'm going to start at the very bottom and work our way up to the very top. So on the very bottom is the, the spool protocol itself. And basically this is how do you construct Bitcoin transactions in order to timestamp um, these ownership actions. And uh, you know, typically this is for if you're an adventurous Bitcoin hacker and you don't want to use some of the higher level stuff, you can go for this. And I'm going to talk a bit about how this um, works and what are the emergent properties. So uh, there's two main transactions, there's register and transfer. So the register is the following. In any given Bitcoin transaction, there is an input or multiple inputs, and then there's outputs. So in this case, the input is the ascribe address, and we publish those addresses. And then on the outputs, let's say that you have three editions. So you have three, it's like three prints of photography, but in this case, it's digital. And so we have the following outputs. We have a hash of the work, which is, well, it's simply that, um, you know, this, and it's a Bitcoin address, remember? So it's um, 30 characters long, and it's the hash. And then we have one Bitcoin address for each edition. We have an, an op return for register, and this is sort of like a way to attach verbs to Bitcoin transactions. So that's how we use it. And finally, there's change. So the way that Bitcoin works, um, even if this transaction only caught, uh, I want to send over, say, 25 cents, but I have $100 in my wallet, I have to send over the $100, and then I get back $99.75. That's just how Bitcoin works. So it's a quirk of Bitcoin, but that's okay. So that's why we need the change. Uh, so this is to register, and once you've registered, it's basically timestamping where you're declaring, I claim that I own this, uh, that I have the copyright rights to this piece of work. Now, the, the second um, transaction is transferring ownership. So it's actually very straightforward. You have a previous address that owns the piece. So it would be one of these here, one of these, for example, in the first one. And then it, it leads to simply a new address for, um, for the new owner. So every time a new person wants to buy an addition, um, we automatically generate an address for them. And um, basically, um, the funds flow from the old to the new. We never, ever, by the way, as an aside, we never ever store passwords or private keys or any of that. So we don't need to, you don't have to, so of course we don't. Um, and uh, besides that, there's two other things that are necessary. Once again, the op return, which is the verb, in this case transfer, and then change. And uh, basically, the, the, to summarize the protocol, you can say the first time that any Bitcoin leaves the existing owner's wallet, 
ownership is transferred to this new wallet or address. Now, this, a really cool thing that happens is provenance, the chain of ownership history, emerges naturally. So you're, it's going from owner one to owner two to owner three to owner four. And you can go into the blockchain and easily see this very straightforwardly. And this is actually critical in some fields. So in the world of art, provenance is everything, actually. If you have a painting that looks like it's 500 years old, but you don't know where it was for 100 years, you don't know whether it's that Da Vinci, that long lost Da Vinci. But actually, um, you can recover provenance sometime um, in, you know, if you do the right forensics and so on. In this case, before um, the, this blockchain-based approach, there was zero provenance for digital. So once again, the example where I had bought a, uh, a piece of art from Jonathan for 1,000 euros, and then I tried selling to, to someone out there, um, they say, how do I know that you own it? Well, now I have an answer. I own it because um, the previous person owned it, and the previous person owned it, and that was attached to the artist. So now, you, instead of no provenance, you have perfect provenance. Uh, and another thing that's kind of cool is every single piece of work gets a unique ID. So in this case, um, how we do it is we just say the, the Bitcoin address of the original owner, right here, that's the ID of the piece. So it's like a serial number or a vehicle identification number. Um, and then you can actually use that. And I'm not sure if you guys saw, but my very first slide, I actually ascribed this, these slides. So um, this slide deck actually has an ascribed address. And I've claimed copyright rights. So, um, so that's, that's that. And uh, in the register transaction, um, what's cool is it's actually binding. When you, when you say ownership, what it is is a binding between um, a creator and a piece of work, a piece of art. And by having these in the same transaction, um, the hash, which is the fingerprint of the piece, and the addition uh, of, of the owner, then it's de declaring that um, it's kind of binding these together for all eternity. So basically, that's the Spool protocol, and um, it's implemented at the, um, in a way that we have it on, running on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, one level above that, um, Interface 2, working up the stack, is um, in order to implement this, we, we're using Python. And the protocol, sorry, we're using something called PySpool, which we actually just open sourced last week. And basically, in four lines of Python code, you can register ownership on the blockchain. Now you have to have your wallet set up and stuff like that, but in general, it's very, very simple. And we've gone way out of our way to document this. So if you go to github.com slash ascribe, you'll, you'll see all of this stuff, by the way. And under the hood, uh, we actually had been using three other Python libraries out there um, for various aspects of um, Bitcoin transactions, Pi Bitcoin tools, and uh, a couple other ones for HD wallets and so on. But we only used, you know, one or two commands from each of those libraries, and it, it, we had a lot of dependencies, so we decided, you know what, let's make a super simple library to support simple transactions, pushing transactions to onto the blockchain, including um, sort of the colored transactions. And so we actually created this library called Transactions, <laughs> and uh, it's dead simple as well. And I'll zoom into both of these, but overall, um, what the interface is about here is making it really easy for others to use this protocol, and it's a reference implementation. So let's do, zoom into PySpool. Um, so you import the library, you declare um, the spool object. Um, the thing you need to do first is you need to refill your wallet just so that you have some um, money to spend. Um, uh, because every transaction costs money. For us, we actually swallow it in Inscribe. So if you're using the service, it's free for anyone using the web app. It costs us three cents. And uh, overall, how do we pay for that? Um, it's actually the, the business customers at scale who are using our, our API at scale. So it's a freemium model, and it works fine. But what that means is people using the web app um, never, ever, ever need to think about Bitcoin or buy Bitcoin. However, if you're using PySpool, you need to have you know, that, because there's not a way to, to pay there. Um, so once you have enough funds in the wallet, then you just um, do a call called register, and you pass in these different arguments that I had pointed out before in the protocol. And that's it. It does it. Um, and then once you've registered, um, you, you can basically specify um, additions in, in different ways. And um, let's see here. And then you can transfer ownership as well. So um, basically, uh, spool.transfer, you pass in the, the, the previous user and the new user, all of this stuff, and it just happens. So it's um, very simple on purpose. And uh, the other library, um, which is transactions library, um, is also very simple on purpose. So you import transactions, um, you create a transactions object, you can create a simple transaction, 
uh, then you sign it. And this is very important. Uh, if you don't sign a transaction, to sign a transaction is declaring that you have the password for that transaction, the private key. Um, and, because otherwise, if you're pointing to an address, you have to be able to send money from it somehow, right? That's part of the, the idea of Bitcoin. And then you basically push this to the network, right? And basically, that's you know, putting it out onto the thousands of Bitcoin nodes that are out there to, to verify. And it's as simple as that, actually. All right. Um, so that was the, the lower level interfaces, um, the, the, the Spool protocol itself, and then the Python implementation of the Spool protocol. Um, and this, this third interface is the REST API. So in this case, it is, well, like exactly like you ex would expect. It's, it's a REST API, um, and you uh, pass in things like uh, the, the, the user email, um, the file URL, this sort of thing, and then it simply returns success, all of that. Um, and this is also all documented on github.com slash ascribe. And where this is used, actually, is if you are running a marketplace um, and you want to sell digital goods, right? Because, you know, before now, let's say, if you want to sell shoes online, right, it's pretty clear you deliver the shoes, the person who bought the shoes gets the shoes, right? But if you're selling, you know, photographs or if you're selling um, digital art or any of this, um, what is it that specifies that that new owner is that person that paid for it is actually truly the owner, right? And um, if you're certain, traditionally you would have had to, you know, once again pay a lawyer five grand or ten grand to sort this out. Now it just comes out of the box. So a way to think about this is um, just like um, PayPal and Stripe kind of made um, payment processing easy. You just plug into them and then you've got it handled. You don't need to worry about PCI compliance and all that. Stripe takes care of it. In our case, um, we're doing ownership processing. So you don't have to worry about all the legals related to ownership and copyright. Ascribe just takes care of it. So it's, it's ownership processing. And finally, on the very top is the, the web app. And this is really for targeting the individual creators, artists, graphic designers, photographers, writers, whoever wants to register can sign their work. And of course, it works for individual galleries, for collectors, any of that. And you can just go on and sign up. It takes you a minute. In fact, I'll give a quick demo later. So overall, you know, going back to this problem um, that I talked about on the internet about ownership um, for creators, collectors, and connectors, so now there's actually a way for creators to claim and protect ownership. And by the way, as an aside, um, kind of the way that copyright law works is as soon as you write something down, as soon as you create something, you actually have the rights to that. But how do you prove that to the world? That's the big challenge, right? And that's what this is about, to sort of have this very convenient way to prove to the world that you own it. In a sense, you know, if you wanted, you could take that, put it onto a USB stick, mail it to yourself, and keep that envelope sealed, right? That's one way, and people do this. We've met many artists who do this. So think of um, what we're doing here is a really convenient post office to mail stuff, okay? Um, and of course, now you get to share without losing control. So um, things can kind of go out there, and um, you don't have to worry anymore. And finally, we actually have a certificate of authenticity. Um, and it turns out, and it's cryptographic, by the way, it turns out that a lot of collectors in the art world and otherwise want to have this sort of piece of paper, or at least PDF document, that says, hey, you know, I'm the owner, and it looks kind of official and all that. So we do that, um, and we make it cryptographic. And in our case, that means we have uh, signed it in the crypto sense using the ascribed private keys. Uh, for collectors, now basically it's really simple. Um, it's enabling secondary markets. It's um, so I can resell um, my, my digital work, I can resell my photograph, all of that. And then connectors, right? Um, if you were going to be starting a, a startup now to um, sell digital art or, or music or any of this, it's going to be a lot easier than before. So um, much less risk of a legal mess, simply because we've taken care of that. And this works across a whole variety of verticals, digital art, 3D photography, and so on. In Ascribe, we've actually, a lot of our uh, marketing is focusing on digital art, simply because it's a really big pain point, but it is a general thing. So. Uh, Quick demo. Um, so once again, here's another great work of art. <laughs> uh, I love Bitcoin and Microsoft Paint, which is actually, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Sorry, it's not GIMP. Sorry, guys. Um, and I, I go to the landing page of Ascribe, ascribe.io. I click sign up. I fill in my, user, uh, uh, my email and a password. That's it. I click on agreeing to the terms of service, because that's this magical terms of service, right? And, uh, and then I go in, and I. Um, now I have a place to drop my artwork, and then I have to enter my, my name, the title, the year created, and the number of editions. So I, I enter all that, I upload the file. Uh, I chose three editions, so this is cool, right? Once again, uh, unique digital editions. I click register, 
And what does it do? It actually takes all this stuff, hashes the piece, and it um, puts it to the blockchain, as well as storing it um, on the Ascribe servers. And that is actually is convenient too. A lot of artists, um, to manage their collection, they, um, it's, sometimes it's like cats, right? So uh, if it's all stored on the cloud in one convenient wallet, if you will, or portfolio, then that's really nice. So, so we do that. And then you have the piece detail. So um, you've got your work, you've got your um, artist name and title and all this, and you've got this Ascribe ID here. So this is actually a Bitcoin address, uh, a serial number, if you will. And what you can do with it, things like transferring, consigning. Consigning means um, letting someone else sell on your behalf. So we have that built in as well. And then you know all the other details, including the spool details, which is um, related to the Bitcoin stuff. And I'll show that. So um, overall then, let's say I register three works. This is your archive of work, your portfolio, your wallet. right? And uh, so that's what I have. And I can, um, I can transfer stuff. So I just click on um, the transfer button um, back here on the top right, the transfer button. And I type in an email of someone I want to transfer to. And now that person gets the IP rights to that work. So it's as simple as that. You can basically email to transfer IP. Um, no more calling lawyers, no more filling out all this contract stuff. Um, it's fixing the UX for IP. And uh, you know, it's a cool thing. This app is using Bitcoin, but you don't have to know Bitcoin at all. But if you want, you can cross-check. So on the bottom of this, there's the spool details. And it gives the ID, and it actually gives links to blockchain.info. Um, as well as um, our, the raw transactions. And it points to the hashes and the other stuff too. So if you click on that first link there, it takes you to blockchain.info, and you can see that this is going on. And blockchain.info is one of the probably dozen services out there that are blockchain explorers. So they're just a way that you know, they look at the blockchain and they make it um, publicly available and searchable and browsable in an easy fashion. So it's a third party service. Or you can go to colored coins, sorry, coinsecrets.org, which is focusing on colored coins, for example. So Ascribe overall, um, this work from Jonathan actually um, was sold at Bitform's New York City. It's probably the world's leading digital art gallery. Um, it's, it's a physical location in New York, actually. Um, and it's been around for about 20 years. And so Jonathan, he actually had three editions of this. And um, this is actually edition two of three. We've got the ID there. And in fact, I think we have this piece on our landing page as well. So he actually did a loan to us. So we actually have the copyright rights via a loan. Uh, uh, artists are, are, have used this actually for things like um, the Berlin Art Prize. So we worked with the Berlin Art Prize folks, and in this case, uh, about 350 artists ascribed 600 works uh, as part of the registration process to apply to the Berlin Art Prize uh, a couple months ago now. Um, this, we're pretty proud of this one. Uh, MAC Vienna, which is this 150-year-old museum, it's older than Canada, um, it actually bought ascribed digital art for its collection. And they're very, very happy with that, right? So um, it's kind of cool, right? This institution that's been around like super, super long is actually buying digital art, and they're very comfortable with it because um, it's basically ascribed. Uh, Coin Temporary, this is an example of a gallery that is selling work online. In this case, they're selling it with Bitcoins. <laughs> so every 10 days, they sell a different piece of work. Um, sometimes it's digital, sometimes it's physical. But for all the digital stuff, they're, they're using uh, this service of Ascribe. And they're very happy with that. They've actually been waiting for a, year, a couple of years um, in order to do digital art. So when, when we connected, they were very happy. And we've worked with them a lot. They're really great. Um, on our landing page, actually, um, there's some other work that we decided we wanted from this artist named Ella Frost. So um, we actually contacted her and said, hey, we'd like to buy some editions of your work. And so uh, we bought them, and she transferred them to us. And now we're using them on our landing page. And that one didn't work out. OK. Um, so here also, uh, actually just yesterday, we announced that Creative Commons is using us. So if you go to creativecommons.fr, it's the France to start with, um, more to come. But France to start with, if you go there, um, you scroll down, you'll see you can register with Ascribe. You click on that button, and it goes to cc.ascribe.io. So it's a Creative Commons, um, basically, wallet or registering service, where you once again register your piece, you give the title, all of that. And then you choose the, the Creative Commons license. So in this case, it's actually registering the work according to one of the six Creative Commons licenses. So it's not just about ownership, actually. It's about attribution. So in this case, you're saying, hey, you know, I'm going to copy left this thing. And I just want to have you know, the rights with whatever license I choose. So some of them are about attribution and so on. And it's basically helping to secure that you own that piece. And we have lots of users for different things, digital artists, photographers, creatives, and marketplaces too. So um, we're, we're 
quite about that right now, but we're working with um, many companies and galleries and um, museums and so on about, um, about ascribing their work. And um, basically overall, you know, we've been coming along, but kind of where we're at right now, the web app is out there, the API is out there, the open source Pi spool and transactions, and um, the, the, track, the part where we crawl the internet, um, we're actually just wrapping up the crawling now. So in June, that's going to be available via the REST API. Right now it's available, but in an alpha form, basically. And uh, it's going to be exposed on the web app as well. So think of it like media analytics, um, like Google Analytics, but to kind of see the, the propagation of your file and where it's shared and all of that. So uh, overall, um, we can think of ownership of digital property, especially on the internet, is a mess, right? Um, despite being anticipated since the 60s, and designed for, right? The World Wide Web won out. It was really, you know, much simpler. And it left this where's my stuff question unsolved. But we figured out a way to answer this, this question of where's my stuff, right? Um, and the where's part is via auto bidirectional links by literally swallowing the internet, internet scale machine learning on images. And not just images, we're actually already doing it for 3D, uh, 3D designs as well. And as time goes on, um, for text and for movies and so on. And then on the My Stuff part, uh, Easy Secure Legals via Terms of ser Service and our Ninja Lawyer, <laughs> and also the, the Bitcoin blockchain. And this is the, the Spool protocol. And all of this is Python. Or, or actually, well, the back end is Python, right? The front end is a bunch of other stuff, React and some other things. So overall, this is about an ownership layer of the internet, or even more generally, the attribution layer of the internet. And I, that's it, actually. So um, I hope you guys found this interesting. Thank you very much. And I guess we'll open to questions. So questions, yes. Uh, go ahead. So if you want uh, to pay for a, for a piece of work with, uh, with bitcoins, but the seller and the, the buyer don't really trust each other, is there a way to make the ascribing and the transfer of, uh, of bitcoins uh, an atomic operation? Uh, there is. And in fact, when we started out, we were doing that, where we had payment processing built into the system. But uh, everyone kind of has their own way of doing um, the buying and selling. And we found that we were getting too close to being a marketplace, and we, those are our customers, right? So we actually removed all of that. So if you want this atomic operation, you would actually go through whatever marketplace you're going through, right? Um, but from our perspective, we really want to focus on the attribution part and avoiding how the actual value transfer uh, of the, the, the money itself. So that was actually a conscious decision to not make an atomic trans transaction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, first of all, um, thank you, great talk. Um, a few years ago, I discovered a project called Xpire, which is basically a method for auto-erasing images, and like giving images a timestamp, like after that time it expires. So I was wondering how are your thoughts on this topic, like I want to rent maybe uh, stuff for exposition, and after a period of time, it just expires, and you don't have the rights anymore. And how are yeah. you solving this? Yeah, for sure. By the way, I can't see you. Where are you? Raise your hand, please. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Okay, hi. Great. Yeah. So actually, that's alone, and we support that functionality. Um, it's uh, the the main use case we see is when uh, a digital artist loans to a museum for an exhibition. So there's a start date and an end date, and that's just how it works. And in fact, um, the work from Jonathan Monahan that we show on our landing page, he's actually loaned that to us for a fixed period of time. So yeah, we support that. Questions? Who was first? Yeah, first of all, uh, super cool, very impressive, making a business out of uh, art, Bitcoin, and copyright law. Yeah, it's very, very cool. I, um, I wondered, do you have a way of dealing with disputes? So, uh, say you didn't like ascribe your slides, and I just found them online somewhere, and I upload them. Um, I'm assuming you can't just rewrite the provenance on the Bitcoin ledger. Yeah, correct. So, um, kind of how we view it is when you're using the Bitcoin ledger, it is evidence um, 
um, that can be used in a court of law in case there I ever is an ownership dispute. And ultimately, that's the ultimate fallback, right? So um, the different people who claim ownership end up in front of a, a judge and jury of their peers, and they talk about it, right? Um, of course, that's relatively heavy friction in the legal process, but even just knowing that it would end up like that with this extra proof helps a lot. So let's say that you don't, don't own a piece, and you register it yourself, um, congratulations, you've just committed fraud and you've etched it into the blockchain that you're committing fraud. So good luck with that one in court, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, and, uh, but as time goes on, we actually um, w see that we want to have um, simpler arbitration processes. And whether we do that or third-party services, we will see. We actually see that a lot of marketplaces have their own approaches to it already. So for us, we're kind of learning about how this should work. And right now, we're really focusing on the authentication aspect itself. Okay, so like two more questions, I'd say. Okay, first, second. Sorry. Fantastic presentation. Uh, thanks a lot. This is really exciting. Uh, two questions. Um, one is if you think, especially in particular, uh, think about photographers, a lot of their work, even though it's digitally uh, made and digitally available, they still sell it uh, in a paper copy. So the question is, do you have you thought about expanding your copyright um, and licensing um, uh, work into the physical world? And the uh, second, yeah. second piece would be, um, how do you, we haven't talked that much anymore about the where is, how do you follow up and how do you police uh, contracts? Yeah, yeah. so for the first part, physical, um, do we do physical, etc. In fact, um, one of our marketplace customers is selling physical paintings. And uh, what we're doing actually um, works for that as well. Ultimately, it is about the copyright. So what, is, what are the media that copyright applies to? It can be physical goods, it can be digital. On the second part, um, the, the crawling the web and giving the information, that actually comes back to uh, right here. So we actually have um, in basically uh, beta right now the crawling the internet and um, offering it up via the REST API. But we haven't built the front end for it yet where you can explore in the sort of media analytics sense. Um, think of it like Google Analytics, but seeing uh, where your stuff is. That will, that's coming, so we're targeting sometime in June for that. Uh, that part is going to be, we're, we're targeting to make it free for all the users of the web app. Um, so it's just, you know, you, you go to the, the page, the web page where you have your art registered and so on, and you click a different button and you can see where it's showing up and how many shares there have been and these sorts of things. Uh, the enforcement, we leave up to the users, yes. Um, and although as time goes on, you know, like you have different actions. Once you discover that someone is using your work, um, there's a few different actions, right? One of them is just let it go, right? And that's usually what you should be doing. And maybe you should be happy because, you know, if you have a piece of digital art and there's a million shares, that's a really great proxy for value, right? Um, in fact, there's some digital artists, they say, my art is going to be sold at, as 10 times the number of YouTube views, right? So, um, and that's actually kind of cool, right? There's one artist we deal with, he, he took that idea and he did it for Pinterest pins, and then he went, uh, and people are like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, and they're liking his pin Pinterest stuff. And then uh, he went and bought 5,000 Pinterest followers, <laughs> just to kind of hack the system even further, right? But going back to your question, um, what are the, when people find out, what are their recourses, right? So there's let go, um, knowing that there's a proxy for value. Um, and then there's different monetization models, right? There's, there's um, tipping, which we think is really cool. And in fact, one of the artists that we're working with actually said, please change tip me with the Bitcoin network with change tip. And um, he was giving away pieces based on that. Um, there's uh, basically emailing them and saying, hey, um, you know, I see that you're using this. Uh, I'd like it if you to, you know, either take it down, please, or just license it for me for 10 bucks or 50 bucks, right? Or you can just send a takedown. And to me, like, takedowns are the bane of the universe. It, it's sort of exactly opposite of how the world should be, right? Part of the reason that takedowns are so prevalent right now is that it's really hard to license work that isn't part of some stock photography library, right? Like, if I do a Google image search, I um, see all these images, it really should be easy to um, know which how, how to basically license that work from each of those owners. So we will build building functionality like this to sort of bias towards, you know, people who want to fairly compensate the creators and bias away from, you know, outmoded ideas of thinking like takedowns, which are exactly backwards, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. The owners have title, right? So, um, 
And if people want to use it, that's great. And ultimately, like when you're buying this stuff, you know that it's going to get out there and so on, right? So um, if you um, if you don't want to buy it, then you don't buy it. If you you know it's going to be shared to a million people or whatever. So if and if you're not comfortable with that, then don't buy the piece. <laughs> I don't fully understand what you mean, but basically like all of this comes down to transfer of copyright rights, right? So this is the difference between access and title, right? So anyone can have a copy and all of that. It's no problem, no problem, right? There's fair use, all of this, right? But who has title, right? And what does title give you? Title gives you the ability to resell. It gives you the uh, ability to loan for like exhibitions and all this, to display publicly, all of this, right? Basically the types of rights that come with uh, having the copyright rights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks for the talk, that's very interesting. Um, I'm curious about how you come across the d like data use case, right? So one problem that you have, like if you're a researcher, is how do you, other than UCI data sets, right, like for machine learning purposes, how else do you get stuff without like scraping or borrowing or stuff, you know, the number of people who use stuff probably without fair use. So I was wondering if that use case had come across? Uh, we've seen a bit of that. Of course, like, I mean, there's a whole bunch of challenges with sort of the curation of data sets. And right now, we're not about curation, right? That's sort of people at one level above. But if you are a curator of data sets, whether you're an archive, who we deal with a lot, uh, an archive of, of images or of art or whatever, um, or um, data sets for UCI or whatever, um, you would use our service to register, to, to loan, and all of that, but we're not trying to solve the problem of curation itself, right? That's, we leave that to other people to, to address. One final thing, too, um, okay. and that is uh, we're hiring. So um, if you guys are interested in us, then um, we actually have uh, um, back end and front end and UX, jo UX jobs available. So, so thank, thank you. you. Give, give a big round of applause.
und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, and the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. O maybe a tip in a restaurant. O da trinkgeld en restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen druckt, auch die uh, 
auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener. Tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in, this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, Transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way, you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. En mi video antiguo he explicado uh, cómo he tomado la decisión de los cuatro años. In my old video, I explained how I made the decision for the four years. In meinem original video habe ich erklärt, wie ich zu die Entscheidung getroffen habe uh, mit den vier Jahren. A continuación voy a pegar este video. Now, later, I will paste this video. Im Anschluss werde ich diesen Video ankleben. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy económico. Uh, at the moment the price of Bitcoin is very cheap. Pero casi todo el mundo tiene muy poco dinero para invertir. But almost everybody has a very little money to invest. Debería decir que esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. 
actually I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's a, rather a game. Um, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important uh, to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key. For example, uh, blockchain.info. Por ejemplo, la empresa blockchain.info. Luego imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo. Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, and for your friends, of course. Eso da motivación a la gente para aprender Bitcoin y... This gives motivation for the people to learn about Bitcoin. Y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente. And the game part uh, consists in the following. Explicas a la gente, mira, esta es la cl clave privada, que es la clave secreta. You explain to the people, look, this is the private key, which must be secret. And uh, you have it and uh, me. And uh, explicas, esa persona y yo mismo la tiene. Y antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años. First, I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later, explain. Después, lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. If uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these four years. So you lose this. That's the, this part of the game. Es la parte del juego.
he creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons eh, la gente tiene cuatro dedos y solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in the Simpsons people have a four fingers and only God has five fingers? Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunos imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde, puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount later, it can be a big help. Uh, no solo para... Bueno, es un juego. <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So, uh, it's... This is the game part. If uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person. But if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out. And it can be really... <laughs> bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada. Y si, por ejemplo... Okay, first translate. Print and not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente. Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar un Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember, uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some Bitcoin and, you, and this person doesn't have any, so you have already this public address where they can send you Bitcoin. <laughs> 